All right, good morning. Can someone um, maybe close those two doors for me, um, just for ambient noise purposes? Thank you. Good morning, thanks for coming today to the SCCR Science Series for April. Um, this is always a popular topic, so I'm excited to see that many people who registered actually are here. There's, the sign-in sheet is here, but I'm, I'm going to start over here, and if you could just circulate it around, make sure everybody signs in. And there will be an evaluation sent later today, so please complete the evaluation and let us know what we can do to improve. And with that, um, I'll just kind of introduce myself and then introduce Connor. Um, so my name is Kira Davis. I'm the Education Program Manager in the Stanford Center for Clinical Research. Um, and we host these types of trainings for clinical research staff about every other month right now. Um, and these types of trainings are really supposed to be scientific or medical in nature um, to help clinical research staff kind of understand more about what we're studying, what we're doing. Um, this topic, again, is always just a highly requested one. Um, I think this is the third time we're doing this class. So again, thanks for coming. Um, Connor O'Brien um, down here is going to be doing our EKG interpretation after my brief presentation on how to place the electrodes. Um, Connor's in his research fellowship year. He's almost wrapping up with that and will be doing an ICU fellowship starting in July. He completed his residency fellowship all here at Stanford um, and med school at UPenn, Columbia. You went to undergrad at UPenn. New UPenn is in there somewhere. Um, so, any questions before we get started? All of our information related to classes that we host um, is on our website, and there's a slide um, later where I can show that to you. Okay, so here's our agenda for this morning. Um, I'm pretty sure we all know what an EKG or an ECG is, but we'll go over that. The purpose of an ECG, some needed supplies um, that you'll need um, to conduct the EKG. Um, we'll talk a little bit about proper skin preparation, and then we'll, the bulk of my presentation and this, why we have this mannequin up here is to show you the proper lead placement, and then I'll invite Connor up to um, teach the interpretation. Okay, so what is an ECG? And I use ECG and EKG interchangeably. They are used interchangeably. Um, I got Connor's opinion on, you know, what do people say in the hospital? Um, I always called it an EKG. Um, EKG is uh, the German electrocardiogram with a K. Um, and many people call it an EKG because ECG sounds like EEG. So, but they're used interchangeably. I will use them interchangeably today. So, um, an ECG is a 12 lead electrocardiogram is a medical test that is recorded using leads attached to the body. It captures the electrical activity of the heart and transfers the activity to graft paper. Results are then analyzed by medical professionals. So asking for your interaction here this morning, why do we perform ECGs? What's the purpose of them? Besides, obviously, understanding the electrical activity. Yeah. Sure. So we want to see what their baseline um, heart activity is doing. This is our first one. Who said that? Monitoring. Yeah, sure. Monitoring, telemetry. Um, there might be, uh, this is a great way to identify changes or problems. So they have symptoms. We want to put them on a monitor to see what their activity is doing. Or they're you know, having heart palpitations. We want to know what that EKG or what that arrhythmia is. So we obviously use this to diagnose arrhythmias. Um, it can also be a tool to, to diagnose indications for other diseases. So you might start having electrical changes in your heart if you have heart failure, for instance. It's a very accurate um, test as long as we set up our electro electrodes properly. It's very safe. It's relatively, you know, painless except for when we rip those ECG leads off our patients. Um, but it is non-invasive, and it's very fast and relatively inexpensive compared to many other tests. So here are our supplies that we will need um, to perform the EKG. Um, we have a, obviously a, an exam table. Um, very important to place your patient or participant at a 45-degree angle or flat. <laughs> 
but many people don't like to lay flat. They may have breathing issues, um, but a 45 degree angle is also uh, the recommended position. Some alcohol swabs for skin prep, which we'll get into um, on the next slide. We have our electrodes, our EKG leads, obviously graph paper, which is usually already in our ECG machine, but important to make sure that you have enough graph paper. Our ECG machine, um, always nice to have a patient um, gown for our participants for warmth as well as modesty, especially with women. And then um, scissors, a hair trimming device, or razor if needed to remove hair. So again, we always want to communicate with our participants, um, explain the procedure, uh, the approximate amount of time that it will take to do the EKG, um, always obviously confirm their approval that they understand and they um, consent to the assessment, perform good hy hand hygiene, and uh, usually the ECG will ask you to enter at least some patient or participant demographic information. Um, many times this is the patient's date of birth, their gender, and um, what visit they're there for. Is it a baseline visit? Is it visit five? And this will be according to your uh, study manual of operations. And then remind the participant to relax, breathe normally, and remain still. So movement, um, talking, breathing abnormally can all cause artifact. We just want them to remain completely still. We, want them, we also want to make sure that their heart rate is normal. Uh, we don't want them coming in, speeding in from the parking lot, trying to get to their appointment on time, and then take the ECG right away. That their heart rate is more than likely elevated. Okay, so for the skin prep, um, we're going to ask our participant to remove his or her shirt, socks, and shoes. Um, also important to ask um, uh, female patients to remove their bra, and this is why we want their, um, a gown, for them to wear a gown, just because we're going to be accessing the chest, and um, really important to not have any clothing in the way. Uh, again, provide a blanket or gown to cover the patient's chest. Next, we're going to prep the skin of each lead placement area with alcohol. Um, some tests or some MOPs require that you use a little bit of like almost sandpaper. It's exfoliator paper. Um, we don't do this in one of our studies. We just use alcohol, but that may be something that you're required to do. Again, um, if there's a lot of body hair, we're going to have to trim that area. Um, and you want to make sure that the participant agrees to that as well. Some men do not want that to happen, so that may be an issue. Um, but we want to make sure that we remove body hair, moisturizers, lotions, um, and sometimes that top layer of skin with the exfoliator paper. And then we're going to place each lead firmly onto the skin. Um, so as you learn how to place the electrodes, um, you're going to want to uh, identify your landmarks and alcohol those landmarks off, right? You're not wiping the whole chest uh, with alcohol. Never place leads um, or the electrodes over ports, pacemakers, medication patches, um, incisions, or open skin. Kind of goes without saying. Um, if there is uh, something on the chest or even if the person has a cast or something on their arm, we're placing four. Um, limb leads, if they have something that prevents you from placing it in the normal area, you're going to want to place that as, as close to that area as possible. So say they have a broken wrist and you can't place the lead on their wrist, you're going to want to place it on the upper arm. Same thing with the limbs and same thing with the chest. If there's a pacemaker or a port, um, you're going to want to just place it as close to that area as possible. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna, we're gonna do is place our limb leads. Um, we have two arm leads and two leg leads. They're labeled RA and LA and RL and LL. So it's pretty easy to identify which leads are appropriate leads. Um, you're gonna wanna place the, um, once you perform um, hand hygiene and then wipe that area off with alcohol, you're gonna wanna go ahead and place the arm leads first. Um, you're gonna wanna place them on the inside of the wrists um, there's less hair here, it's on, a, on soft tissue, you're not going to want to place it on the radius or, or anywhere else on the arm, um, not on any bony prominence. And then below the el elbow is preferred. Um, again, if they have something that prevents them from placing it on the wrist, place it on the upper arm. Same thing with our lower limb leads. Um, inside the ankle, kind of right above the ankle bone, 
um, again, perform alcohol, the, use the alcohol to clean the area, and um, again, on a soft area, not on any sort of bone. And then I go ahead and clip the leads onto the electrodes as I go. Um, it kind of removes those four leads out of the way right away. So you're not dealing, once you get to the chest, you don't have 10 uh, cables to place. So I do the arms and legs first, and that way those are out of the way, and, um, and then we move on to the chest. So um, this morning, I'm going to ask all of your, you to participate kind of on your own chest to locate the landmarks that I'm going to mention. So the first thing we're going to do is locate um, our sternum, which is that flat bone in the middle of our chest. Uh, and the first lead we will place is V1. And it's going to be to the right sternal border, so right to the right of that sternum. And we're going to count down on our chest, and that's why I have my lovely mannequin here. So we have our participant at a 45 degree angle or flat. Light is very bright. <laughs> um, thanks. We have our leads. Let's see if you guys can see this. Um, so we know we're going to be on the right side of the chest. So our patient's sternum is right here. We're going to be somewhere around here. But the first thing we want to do is locate the clavicle. So feel on your chest or up here where your clavicle is. You're going to take two finger widths right below your clavicle. And that's kind of that soft area. The first bony area that you feel is going to be your first rib. The first soft area right under the first rib is our first intercostal space. And we're going to count down on our ribs, on our mannequin here. He doesn't really have ribs. Um, you're going to count down to the fourth rib, which is kind of right here. And then right underneath your fourth rib is your fourth intercostal space. So where's the first landmark we find? Sternum. And then we count down from the clavicle. One, two, three, four. And that first soft area is our fourth intercostal space at the right sternal border. And that is going to be our first placement of V1. We're going to repeat the process, same exact process, on the left side. Locate your clavicle, two finger widths right under your clavicle, and count down on your ribs. So one, two, three, four. So it's right about here. Yeah. When you have patients who have uh, body weight, mm -hmm. uh, do you feel the actual sure that the leg? Yeah, you I mean, sure, I mean, I, that's happened. Um, you can still feel some of the, especially the sternum, and you can, worse comes to worse, you have to eyeball it, because that's the best case scenario if you can't really palpate the ribs. And how much would that affect the results of the patient? If you're in the general vicinity, your results will be fine. Um, but it is still really important to identify the appropriate landmarks to the best of your ability. Um, people's anatomy can also be a little bit different. Yeah. So um, that's why we don't want, you don't want to eyeball it. You want to really count the ribs and count the intercostal spaces. Um, but if someone has, say, you know, scoliosis or they're kyphotic, that can actually kind of alter their anatomy. Still really important on both sides to count. You don't just want to say, okay, V1 goes here, and I can just eyeball parallel right across and do V2. You want to really count on both sides. Okay? So the next lead we're going to do um, is V4. So we're going to skip over V3. Yeah. Uh, so at the more chest, mm -hmm. the lower angle, you're yeah. going to place the lead right in there. And the second one, you're going to place them you know, more on the flatter part, but it's going to go on the breast if you're on the breast. Yeah, so these two leads are going to be the same for women. Um, where it does get a little bit different is around this area. Um, and again, that's why we want them in a position, right? If, they're, if women are upright like this, that's going to be even more difficult. That's why you want them at a 45-degree angle, and that tissue actually kind of moves out of the way a little bit. But um, 
you, in some, in some aspects, will have to kind of lift that tissue and place the lead um, under the tissue. Does that make sense? So if you have to, if you have to, I have a piece of ice in my mouth. <laughs> if you have to lift, you have to lift that tissue up. You don't want to put any leads on the breast tissue. Sorry, I didn't want to crunch ice in your guys' ears. <laughs> um, okay, so the next lead we're going to do is lead four. Um, uh, we're going to again locate our clavicle, and this is in the mid clavicular line, so right down the middle of the chest, um, using the clavicle as a landmark. And we're going to go to the fifth intercostal space. So if we know four is here, five is about right here, and we're going to match these two planes. So fifth intercostal space, mid clavicular. It's usually right in line with the nipple, um, but again, you want to make sure that you're counting and identifying those appropriate landmarks. So we have V1, V2, and V4. <coughs> we're going to next do V3. There's no landmark identification for V3. Um, it's just right in the diagonal plane as V2 and V4. So V3, you're not going to count anything. You're just going to essentially eyeball it and put V3 right in the middle here. And I should have really turned these like this. So there's more room on this guy's chest. So we have V1, V2, V3, V4. The next thing we're going to do is locate the landmarks for V6. So we're skipping over V5. So you're, what you're going to do is ask your participant to raise her or his left arm, and you're going to find the mid-axillary line. So really, you're just kind of identifying the armpit. And same plane, you're not going to go any lower than this on the chest. So we're at the fifth intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. So right here, it's the same plane that you would put, that you'd put your V4. And this is on the lateral aspect of the participant. So we're not, we're not going over here. We're going right here. So same plane and then the lateral aspect of the participant, the mid-clavicular line. Okay? So that's V6. Same plane, mid-axillary line. Yep. Okay. And the last one we're going to do is V5. Same thing that we did with V3. Um, no identification of landmarks. We're going to go um, right in between V4 and V6, right under kind of the chest right here. And so again, for female participants, um, you're going to want to remove, you're going to want to, if you need to, lift that tissue up. Um, again, don't place any leads on the breast tissue. In And then um, all the cables um, that you'll connect to the electrodes are labeled V1 through V6. These are our chest leads or our precordial leads. Um, and again, all the leads are labeled. Um, so you want to make sure that you place the leads on the right electrode. Um, I usually do all the electrodes at one time um, because I'm kind of in a groove and just place all the electrodes. And then you'll place your leads and clip your leads on to the electrodes. Okay. So we went through all of that. Any questions about landmarks or placement? Okay, so to wrap up, um, again, we'll clip <coughs> our precordial electrodes with the, with the leads. Um, and then depending on what your ECG machine looks like, there's obviously different varieties out there. Um, but many of the buttons are capture um, or start even and you will capture the ECG, ECG tracing. When you look at the screen on the ECG machine, you want to make sure that you see pretty consistent waveform. Now, they may or may not have an arrhythmia, but artifact is pretty easy to identify. It's like a whole bunch of squiggly lines. Um, if you see that artifact, maybe the participant is talking, maybe your leads are, are in the wrong position, maybe the electrodes, you kind of mix up V5 and V6, and you just have to switch them. Um, so just make sure that everything is correct. Look at your tracing. Um, again, if there's artifact, maybe ask someone else to come and help. 
as you've tried to troubleshoot the problem and you can't figure it out, get a second pair of eyes in there and um, see if they can help you. Uh, recommend, so once you, you've captured, it'll print out on the graph paper. Um, you want to hopefully have someone else review it, if it's your PI or research nurse or, or someone else. Um, you want to make sure that someone says, okay, looks good, before you take all the leads off. Because if there is an issue, you don't have to go through this process all over again. With a participant, you'll save time, you'll save maybe some pain from the participant um, you know, taking those leads off. They don't, they don't hurt most people, but some people can have reactions to the adhesives or especially with, with men, if there's more hair, that might be a little uncomfortable. Um, do ask the participant if they want to remove their own leads because sometimes that's less painful. Um, I think that's all I have and then I'll invite uh, Connor up here. Any questions? Yeah. A little something is okay. Um, you, yeah, you don't want those very hairy chests that, that won't that you won't get a good. It'll stick to the hair and it won't stick to the skin. So for, if your area is mostly clear of hair, and that's why you know you don't want to obviously shave the whole chest or anything, but shave or trim those areas where there's do the best you can. It's not like we have to wax people, but we want to make sure that the area is relatively clear of hair. And it just has to do with the adhesive of the electrode sticking to the skin and not to anything else. And that's why we don't want sweat or the sweat, your lotions or moisturizers, anything like that will not cause the adhesive to stick. Okay, awesome. <laughs> that was like a golf clap, you guys. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so, let's see. All right, so my name's Connor, I'm one of the cardiology fellows here. I actually finished last year, but I'm doing research now, so I'm still around. Uh, and I was to talk about interpreting EKGs. When I give this lecture, you'll see, I mean, there's all these figures from books, they're great, but one of the things I'm really gonna focus on is trying to teach concepts and the concepts of EKGs, there's very few concepts that need to be applied but are universally uh, important in every factor of the diagnostic process using an EKG. And also a lot of the questions you guys just asked about you know, how to shave the chest, how much contact you need, those actually are directly tied to the concepts of EKG. Just for example, since this is fresh in your memory, if you have anything on the skin, even if you have perfect contact from the lead to the skin, electrical signal does not necessarily transmit through that substance, right? So if you have a substance that's acting as an interface between the electrode sticker and the heart itself, you're gonna lose signal. So you could have the electrode lead sitting flat on the chest and have a really low amplitude EKG wave, like a little tiny thing when it's supposed to look like this. And this, these tiny waves, if they look small as opposed to being big, that has significant diagnostic importance when you're interpreting EKGs. So when I'm describing all the concepts here, I'll try to go back as to why PrEP is important, how using these concepts helps you quality control your EKGs so that when you're putting leads on, you're looking saying, is this a good EKG? Like, do I want to hit print and put this in this person's chart? Or what are some of the flags that help you understand, you know, when should you be moving your leads around repositioning your patient, things like that. So this guy's Dr. Einhoven. He started off by describing the vectors of the EKG. So this is one of the more important concepts in EKG. So we're going to talk about this. First thing I want everybody to do, because not everybody's great with spatial understanding when you're thinking about it, but most people, when you look at something, can kind of conceptualize it. Take your hand, put it like this. I want your left hand facing your chest wall, okay? Your heart is roughly shaped like this, right? Your atria are in the back, and the ventricle, the pump, is on the bottom, shaped like this. It doesn't sit in your chest straight up and down, right? It actually sits in your chest like your hand is sitting right now, okay? So when you're thinking about the angles, this is really important because all the angles, where these leads and what these things are telling you, is dependent on reading the direction electricity is moving. 
and it's moving through the heart. So the most important thing that you have to anchor right now is that you have to understand how the heart sits in your chest, right? So it sits in your chest slightly angled down, at approximately, you know, something like a 60-degree angle. So if like, here's your midline, right, 90 would be your shoulder. The heart is actually going slightly forward, okay? So it's not vertical. So you measure, anytime you're trying to measure electricity, it goes from ideally the top of the heart down to the bottom, okay? And we'll talk about how these tracings help you recognize that. Important things. One, not everybody's heart is equally or is this oriented the same in their chest. And we don't need to get into specifics, but, you know, as you see in your research, people have disease states, right? Certain parts of the heart get larger than others. Or if you're aorta, the vessel on the top gets large. Imagine if the aorta stretches, that pushes the heart back, right? The heart, the phys your right ventricle, if it gets big, it's going to push the heart that way. So anytime you get EKGs, and there's all sorts of structural things that are going on in that person's chest that are going to be impossible to control for. So if you have funny-looking EKGs, this is why consistency between each recording is important because you'll never make it look normal across all people, right? And that also helps you with diagnostics. So let's go through here. We're going to talk about each portion of the EKG. So first things, draw a line down the middle of the screen. I want you to ignore this half for now, okay? We're going to talk about these six tracings and the directions that they, for, the, the, what they're telling you. This side of the EKG, this is called the limb leads. And we'll, I'll show you those pictures in a minute. So when you put the leads on a patient, when you're putting them on the arms and the leg, those are the limb leads. Okay? So just think, when you hear limb leads, and there's certain things I'll talk, we're going to teach you about that you're going to need to measure from limb leads, that half of the EKG. Precordial leads are this half. And what that means, when you put your six electrodes on the chest going across the front of the heart, that's this half. This tells you something totally different. So for now, when we're talking about vectors, we're thinking about this side. Okay, this is your limb lead side. Okay, going forward. So now, this is from a very famous EKG book, and they're trying to impress upon you the direction in which each of these cameras is perceiving electrical signal. Now, when I was, that first lesson I was talking about, when you're thinking about the direction electricity moves on an EKG, a positive wave, which means it goes that way, up is positive, down is negative, okay? What that's telling you is the net direction of electricity. So a really tall positive wave means the camera, which is, one of your, is going to be your limb leads, is seeing that electricity move straight at it. Okay? So if your heart sits like this, signal normally comes from the top here. This is where the rhythm generator, your sinus node, sits. This is what makes your heart beat. Okay? It moves down and to the left. So if you were an EKG lead living out here, you would see electricity moving from back here straight at you. So you would have a very positive signal. If you were an EKG lead that lived back here, right, you would see electricity moving away from you. So you would have a negative signal. So that's what that means. Now, if you have electricity, if your lead, let's say your lead, or sorry, let's say your lead over here, and electricity is moving that way, you're watching electricity run by you. And it's very difficult if you've ever watched it, I'm trying to think, you guys know the Doppler effect? You know, like when a siren's coming towards you, right? The frequency goes up, it goes away from you, the seat frequency drops, right? If you're sitting to the side of an ambulance, that doesn't change. If you're looking right at it, it's a big change because the sound, the speed in, of the sound in the ambulance is compressing much more as it comes towards you if you're in a straight line. If you're off to the side, the speed of the ambulance doesn't affect how quickly the wave gets to you, right? So what, you're, what you'll end up seeing and I know that's sort of con complicated to explain, but what you'll end up seeing is something more like this, okay? Low amplitude, you can't really tell the speed, and it's usually biphasic. And if it's truly perpendicular, perfectly perpendicular, right? So if you're right here and the sound is going four or 90 degrees away from you, you will have an equal positive and an equal negative component, okay? And then there's anything in between there, 
you're going to have gray. It can be more, a little bit more up, a little bit more down, and we'll explain that. Now, so your limb leads. Remember, you have one on your arm, one on your arm, one on your leg, and one on your legs. So some of, a lot of this is going to be calculated by the machine because you, don't, you see six cameras there, right? So you, and you only have four electrodes. And actually, this was based on having three electrodes. So some of these are going to be calculated, and we'll talk about that. So first, one here, left arm. So you, this is your left vector on your limb lead. Two is going down this way. See this camera? Three is down to the right. All right? Then you have AVR, which is over your right shoulder. So let's just think AVR right. AVL is left. That's going to be your left shoulder up this way. AVF is straight down in between two and three. Okay? And this represents a 180 degree picture because not only did each one of those, so you notice that you only have some of the positive directions being monitored, but remember, negative signal also matters. So if you have a negative deflection, that tells you a lot about the direction of electricity. So both of the, every one of these lines really gives you a 180 degree signal. Right? Not just this way, but also tells you a lot about stuff going the opposite way. And we'll talk about that. Okay. Any questions there? So this is just representing the, the limb lead. Mm -hmm. So you have limb lead. So, what is mem so remember, your, your leads, you're going to be calculating electricity moving between the limbs, and between, or between the arms and between the legs. And now what this does, so for what you can tell here, two and three will be directly calculated but by the tra trajectory of electricity hitting those leads on your legs. One will be calculated by the trajectory of electricity hitting your left arm and your right arm, and make, it can make a signal between those two. So one represents the four. Yeah, so all, and all of these in modern machines are really aggregated. To, they're calculated by algorithms, right? So there's a, lot, there's a lot of things that happen in the machine. But the thing that you want to remember is the general trajectory, what each of these is showing you, because the trajectory of electricity is really important because it tells you what a good EKG should look like. Now, the reason this is important, one of the things that happens really commonly, especially when you're moving really fast, is people will take look at the labels right on the EKGs. Have you guys all seen the labels that are on the wires of EKGs? That's something, maybe not everybody's seen that. Okay, so the, these are labeled as right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg, right? And you can imagine people are moving quickly, emergencies, all sorts of things. You can see leg, and you put it on the leg, or arm, and you put it on an arm, okay? So just to pick on somebody, since you pseudo-volunteered, <laughs> what would happen to this signal, one, left arm, if you flipped your arm leads? So what would happen to this? Negative, exactly, right? So if you ever see a negative signal in one, this is really common. We see this all the time when we're reading EKGs. Somebody either has a massive infarct or somebody flipped the leads. And there's other things you can do. But when you see, when, if you know the progression that you're looking for, you can catch that mistake, right? Or say, is there a serious problem, right? There's either a mistake in how I did the EKG or it's a serious medical situation. And so that's really, and the reason that happens, imagine, right, if you flip the arms, the machine now thinks that the signal that should be going this way is now being seen from the lead that's hooked up on this, this the, sorry, the, the arm that's hooked here, the lead that's hooked here, or supposed to be hooked here, is now over here. And so what it does is, one, it's still reading one the same. It's expecting the electricity to come this way. But now you flip the leads. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's really important. That's where these vectors come in. So under, making sure that your machine is set up properly tells you which direction the electricity is moving and also tells you the opposite direction. So the other thing that you can use it for is you might see that some, not all the, or if all of your vectors are going in the wrong direction, what are the chances you mishooked up all the leads, right? Now you start thinking about something's different in the person's chest. So that's why it's important to always look at all your leads. So you say, okay, does this make sense? One is positive, right? Two is, um, oh my God, isoelectric. So that means that you have a lot of signal going this way, 
and it's feasible to think that you have perpendicular signals. So if you have an electrode here, and if you have electricity going perfectly that way, it's not going to see uh, a lot of positive going in that direction, right? So now you go down to three. Three should be down this way. Three is negative, right? So three is telling you the same thing one is telling you. AVR is this way. So now that's negative. One's positive. AVL is positive, right? And AVF, which should be down here, is negative. So now you just went through all of those. That all makes sense, right? So the, direction, the electricity is clearly moving in that direction based on all the leads. So this is really important because that can help you understand the consistency of your EKGs. If you've made a mistake by hooking up the wrong leads, or if the patient has something very strange in their chest and all your leads are, it might be showing something you weren't expecting, but they're all consistent with one another. Okay? So let's keep going. All right, so we, can't, we just went over this. And we were just talking about lead to, uh, lead to oh, so this is uh, talking about rhythm strips versus uh, each individual one. So one thing when you're reading EKG, so each lead is broken up up here. You will have a rhythm strip down at the bottom, and this is just one lead that's going to play continuously. The purpose of this is if you, since these are all taken at different time points, they will not always show the same thing. So if you have a arrhythmia or something pop up in one set of leads, it's nice to have another lead to confirm what you saw over here. Say, like, was this a blip in those leads, or did I also see it in these leads and a limb lead? If that makes sense, but that's a, we'll get to that a little bit later. But that's your rhythm strip, if anybody ever brings that up. <clears throat> okay, so now, this, we, the hand exercise we started off with, this is what I want to sort of correlate, or what I want to correlate that with. Now, understanding your anatomy and how the heart sits helps you understand each of the waves. So we're about to talk about each wave. And keep remembering the vectors that we just talked about because that's going to be the basis for understanding how electricity moves through every one of these chambers, okay? So your signal starts up here with your pacemaker, right? This is your natural pacemaker. And it's always a little confusing, right? Because the heart, when you look at a picture of it, if you think about it in your chest, you have, to, you have to rotate it like that. So again, put your hands like this, right? So your right atrium is on the right side of your left hand, and the rhythm generator, sinus node, starts, is in the back here, okay? That's going to be right in that direction. So now, you can put your hands down. So I'll show you, electricity goes through the atriums first in normal rhythms, right? So this is your sinus beat. This is when your atria contract. Yeah? Fingers are the ventricle. Yeah. No, that's a good question. Make sure that we get this right. Because the, all the, uh, the important parts, understanding the first parts of this lecture matter a lot for the rest of the interpretation. So, yeah, so these, the fingers, are your ventricles. The, these are the pumps, right? This is what really circulates blood around the body. The top are the atria. And the atria, so the atria, when you have a heartbeat, blood flows into them passively. So deoxygenated blood comes back from all your veins, so out of your brain, up from your legs, all into the right atrium. The right atrium contracts, and these are very thin structures in sin a sinus beat. The left atrium contracts, and this is taking oxygenated blood back from the lungs. Blood flows simultaneously into the ventricles. Then the ventricles contract, push blood out through the pulmonary artery and the aorta. Okay? So when you're looking at EKG, the P wave, and we'll talk about that in a minute, represents atrial contraction, both sides. Electricity on your P wave is going from your sinus node over to the left atrium. Those two things contract, and electricity moves in 3D. That's the other thing that's kind of complicated. I don't want to, we're not going to hark on that too much right now, but it moves like this. And so what you're seeing is atrial contraction, and then those converge on something right here called the AV node, and we'll get to that. That acts like a circuit breaker that sends signal into the ventricles. Signal moves down the middle, out the side, and the pump contracts simultaneously on both sides. Okay? And the, the coordinated nature of this on an EKG is what makes things narrow 
crisp, regular. If you start to see anything irregular in rhythm or any signal widens, what that's telling you is quite literally electricity is taking longer to move. And we'll talk about that. So the wider any wave is, the more diseased your ventricle is, the harder it is for electricity to get through, and that tells you a lot about your patient. All right, so we just talked about, or actually didn't quite get to this. So diastole, just to be uh, thorough, this is the relaxation of the heart. Diastole, when we'll point this out on the EKG, is a, re is a recovery cycle, and that is active on the EKG. So when you're thinking about muscles, most people, right, when you're relaxing or doing something, you're thinking about the muscle resting. In that window, the electrical system of the heart is preparing to fire again. And that's actually when you're doing, especially for research purposes, you're going to be measuring the QT interval on a lot of people. That is the recovery. The ion channels, the, thing, the channels in your heart that help it fire, so they, the ion channels move, electric, or move ions to help create voltage. And we'll, I'll describe that in a little bit. Those are recovering. And so if you disrupt that process, there's a lot of risks in there. So heart relaxation is actually an active electrical process. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But remember that because that's what you're thinking about physically on the heart. And when you see in the EKG, there's actually a lot of activity, that things that are signals for problems. Systole, now this is when the heart's contracting. This is the QRS on the EKG, that really tall wave, okay, that we're pointing to tell you the direction. That's representing this contraction. And again, if the signal's wider, that means your systolic function is abnormal. Something's going wrong in, in the way the heart contracts. It's not moving in a synchronized fashion. If you're actually watching, if it's a wide wave, you can be watching one side contract before the other like this. And we'll get to that in a little bit. All right, we'll skip through this. Okay. So, the deep So, let me talk about, I want to talk about this, and we're going to go back to college really quickly. And I apologize. This is, there's a lot of basic science here, but I really want people to understand this, because understanding some very, very fundamental things here helps you understand what you're seeing, and we can make it pretty simple. So, membranes, so your, your cells, right? What they do to help them fire is they establish a gradient of electricity, okay? So imagine like when you walk a rock up to the top of a hill and you roll it down, the f taller the hill you go up, the faster that rock is going at the bottom. Electricity works the same way. Your membrane has these pumps, and what it does is it separates charge. It'll move positive charge to one side, electrical or negative to the other. Right? And just like magnets, these two things, these charges pull together. So they want to come together. And there's a lot of energy that comes by separating them. And when they come together, that also generates energy. So what your heart is essentially doing is rolling a rock up a hill and then letting it go, and that's what lets it beat. Okay? So all of these electrical signals, what you're seeing is these, chart, these open and on systole or contraction, you're watching charges equalize. Okay? So in, when you're having a systolic event, right before that systole happens, these charges move through these channels, come together, and that generates a lot of energy that allows the heart to beat. Okay? And there's a whole bunch of cellular signaling that comes along with that that allows the heart to beat. This is a very simplified version, but remember that. Now, in active repolarization, and that's in the diastole, you're watching these charges be separated by the pumps. So you're watching this happen. Okay? Questions? Ask anything. Because this is, learning this, this is like weeks of lecture in undergrad. Seems... Clear enough? Okay, cool. So, now, what we're looking, when we say depolarization, right, so this is literally taking away your polarization. Polarization, these are separated. Depolarization, they're coming together. Okay? So what you're watching here, this is your P wave. 
That is atrial depolarization. So that is the heart firing, opening the floodgates, allowing those charges to come together, and the atria goes bam, and it fires. What you are seeing here, though, remember, this is electrical. So what you're seeing on the EKG is actually the movement of these charges. Right? You're not actually seeing function. An EKG is not watching muscle move. You're watching the electrical interpretation of muscular movement. And that's really important. So when you hear about people going into PEA arrest, or have you guys done ACLS? Okay, so, for the, so there's some people who have some people, and just really quickly, you can see a normal EKG, and you take a picture of the heart, and it's not moving. So what that means is you're having electrical activity, and if you did an EKG and that per, you thought that person was sleeping, you'd say, oh, they're asleep, the heart's moving. If you take a picture, the heart's not moving. So that's a whole medical pathway in an emergency situation um, that you can see. So that's why it's important to remember that what, there's a separation between the function, like the mechanical activity, and the electrical activity, Okay. But here, what you're watching is this charges moving in the atria that theoretically lead to normal contraction. The signal then, remember, moves down to that junction, that little fuse box I pointed out right in the middle of the heart, then gets into the ventricles, and this is the ventricles firing in the QRS. And then this is that repolarization phase. So when, you're seeing, when the heart relaxes, what you're seeing here is the heart actively separating charges, moving everything back into the places where it needs to go so the heart can fire again, all right? So let's just look at a few important parts. So P wave, we mentioned, atria. These labels, you'll see them come up in diagnostics a little bit. So this is the Q wave, and not every lead has each component uh, that you're, I'm going to point out here. So don't get hung up on an absence of a portion of the wave. Because your ability to see that portion of the wave depends on the orientation of the heart. EKGs are not perfect. So this is a perfect tracing. You very commonly will not see this, okay? And the absence of these things, and we'll talk about this later, is not necessarily good or bad. Now, but this is the Q wave. Now, the R wave is the positive deflection. Very commonly, you'll see this flat part. The R wave happens, and there's no Q wave at all, all right? You, and this is the S wave. Now. Again, remember the direction of these and which one is bigger just tells you the direction of electricity. So what you might see is if electricity is moving this way, you may see a very small R wave and then a huge S wave. Or very commonly, you'll see basically no R wave and a very tall S wave. Okay? So the direction, S is just down, R is up. All right, and then T wave here is the repolarization now. You'll see segments, and we'll talk about this in a minute. Any segment that you're asked to measure is going to be the distance from the beginning of one segment described in the title to the second letter. So, for example, QT interval right, is going to be from the Q wave, the onset of the Q wave right here, to the end of the T wave. The PR interval is from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the R wave. Okay? So you'll see that. All right, let's keep going. Now, this is the, the sinoatrial node. So this is your rhythm generator in a healthy heart. This is the natural pacemaker. It lives in the top right part of the heart. And this shows you how electricity moves in three dimensions. So these are the atria, right? both sides, and here are the ventricles. Electricity starts up here, and it moves simultaneously, right? So you want your atria to contract together, so you have a track going into the right atrium here, a track going into the left atrium here, and then they ideally come down and converge here before they go to the ventricles, right? That's so remember, these wires are like spider web networks. So they go out and they ideally get coordinated contraction by having everything covered at the same time. And, oh, sorry. And when you're watching, so let's just talk about intervals real quick. So when we talk about intervals, try to remember the structural relationship that that implies because that helps you understand what you're watching in the heart. So the P wave, right, is the onset of electrical activity here to the point where it finishes here, okay, where it finishes depolarizing the atria. Then you have that pause, 
the PR interval, right? So what this tells you is how much time do you have before this fires, before the ventricles fire. So that represents the transit time in this very early part up here before you hit the ventricles. Okay, so just remember where the electricity is at each point. And then the QRS, the width of that QRS, is telling you how long it takes to go down these wires. And if you think of those things as individual pieces, you can start piecing together, does this person have delays in multiple segments, in a single segment? Right? So as people get older, you'll often see all of the wires in the heart get diseased. So you'll see the PR segment get long. You'll see atrial depolarization get longer. And this will get, the QRS will get wider. Some people have inflammatory, like young people have inflammatory autoimmune disease that attacks the heart. You'll see this be fine. But then you'll see this part get damaged individually. So it tells you a little bit about what's going on inside the person. Is it chronic disease of the heart that's affecting everything? Is there unique pathology going after one piece of the heart? All right? So SA node, we talked about this. So this is the atrial depolarization. And keep going. So now this is the, yeah, this is more about the P waves. I want to keep, I don't want to run over time. AV node. Okay. So let me just make sure I covered everything here. Yeah, so don't, I wouldn't worry so much about this for your purposes. Uh, they're talking about the different tracks that can generate arrhythmias, and we'll come back to that. I don't want to focus on that yet. I want to go through the normal structure just now. So now AV node. Now, the AV node is a really important piece of the heart, okay? And this matters a lot for uh, arrhythmia protection, and a lot of the things that you will be working on at SCCR have a lot to do with uh, trials related to arrhythmias. Now, the reason it's important is the AV node acts like a fuse box, okay? It protects the ventricles from the atria. So if you think about AFib, right? So let's go back here so we have a little structural picture. Ignore that, ignore that circle for me. Well, actually, we can fix that. There we go. Okay, now, in AFib, does anybody know how fast the atria go? It's faster. You did Apple Heart. Any idea? 250. So 400. 400 times a minute. So you have these little circuits that are tiny. And basically, electricity is running around them super fast and then propagating out into the heart. If your heart rate was 400, you would be dead. Right? Your heart can, needs time to contract and relax, which is why when you exercise, if you push yourself so hard that your heart rate's in the 200s, you don't last very long because at this point you're just not circulating oxygen very efficiently because the heart's really not opening and closing, right? You don't give it time to really get fill up, kick oxygen out. So if, you were, if you're, every single atrial signal went to the ventricles, everybody with AFib would be dead, right? So why does that not happen? And the reason that doesn't happen is the AV node, which sits right here. And what it does is it protect, so it acts as a fuse box. So it can only fire so often. It has a recovery cycle. And the recovery cycle is how long it takes it to complete this process, how long it takes it to separate those charges so it can fire again and send signal to the ventricle and say, now it's time for you to go, right? So with the AV node, you might have an atrium that's going 400 times a minute, but your ventricles may be going 60. Because the AV node says you only need to go 60 times a minute, and the AV node is actually directly attached to nerves that, deter or that know how much oxygen you need at any given time. So people in AFib who have a heartbeat of 60, if they go for a run, their heartbeat will go to 90. So the AV node can respond to your need for oxygens and your exercise output while also protecting you against having up uh, very fast signals upstream. And there's, and there's some other things we can talk about there. But remember, that is really, really important because also every time you take medicines for AFib that you're trying to slow somebody's heart rate down, what you're doing is you're poisoning the AV node. You're slowing down how fast the AV node can fire. So that's, the AV node is the most common point of therapy for, all ra for pretty much every rapid heartbeat, di rapid heartbeat disease where it comes from the atria. Okay. So, now, when you leave the AV node 
which is always represented by a little sort of blob that sits right there. Things lead into the Hiss. And this, these are just wires, OK? Now, the Hiss allows for simultaneous contraction of the ventricle, so it conducts electricity very rapidly through the heart muscle so that both sides can contract at the same time. Why that's important, imagine if you were a pump, right? If you had to squeeze, let's say you have, imagine you have a plastic bag, right? And let's say you have a thin little membrane between the two. What happens if you squeeze one side of that bag? Or actually even better, let's say you have a water balloon. What happens when you squeeze that water balloon? Somebody in the back, help me out. Displaces, exactly, right? It just shifts. So if you squeeze this side and this side is relaxed, the septum is just going to go bloop. If you want to force blood out of the heart through the aorta, you have to have a stiff wall. In order to have a stiff wall on both sides, you need to have electrical activation, heart muscle activation at the same time. Okay? So that's why this is so important that both of these are moving fast, both of these are healthy, and you have synchronized beating. If you have a disease where, let's say, you just cut this wire, electricity goes through this wire, and then no longer moves from, through an electrical system. You can move electricity from heart muscle to heart muscle, but it moves much, much slower, right? So electricity, if you were, imagine if you were trying to get, if you had a wire, right? You, if somebody's holding on to metal and you touch the metal, they get shocked. Very, like all the electricity makes it into that person. If you have something that's less conductive, minimally conductive system, like let's say you have your hand in water with no salt in it, and you touch the electricity, you'll get some electricity, but you get a little bit of a zap, right? What happens is if electricity is moving down this wire, then for this side to get electricity, it has to go through the muscle all the way around the heart in a three-dimensional structure to make this side go. So in effect, what you see is boom, boom, and the heart just swings. It's very inefficient. So what, you'll see, what you're seeing here, or what you'll see on the EKG, is a wide QRS, because you're watching one side go quick, and then the QRS is really wide because the other half of the heart is depolarizing very, very slowly, as electricity literally moves from heart muscle cell to heart muscle cell to heart muscle cell, rather than down a wire, and this wire activates all the heart muscles at the same time. Okay? So that's really important that this works in both sides simultaneously. All right. So let's, and these are Purkinje fibers. Purkinje fibers are, are the uh, smaller portions of the Hiss. So this, your Hiss is this portion in the middle. Purkinje fibers are the smaller fibers that reach out of the myocardium that activate the heart muscles all at the same time. Less important for these purposes. Okay. So this, yeah, and this is what I was saying before, the QRS representing active depolarization on both sides. So there's a lot of things, so let's just take a pause here. First off, any questions? Anything? Cool. All right, so there are some things that I want to make sure that we link to the beginning of the lecture and right now, because this is really important. This applies to all of the waves, the P wave the Q, and the QRS complex. The amplitude, the height of this QRS tells you how much electricity you are seeing. Okay? Remember, electrical signal comes down the wires, and then remember, all of these wires are attached to heart muscles. And all the heart muscles generate electrical signal when they're activated. Okay? So if you have a young, healthy heart, you should see a tall QRS. Now, if you saw a very short QRS, let's say here, what could that represent? This first sentence, simple. What have you lost? Positive, but what have you lost? EKGs measure what? Very fundamentally. Okay, so the electrical flow is not there, right? EKGs represent electrical, a movement of electricity. So you've lost electricity. Yeah. 
So, so electricity, the, the speed, that gets kind of, speed should be relatively constant because it happens so fast that the uh, movement of electricity, that don't bring that in as a factor because for our purposes, it, that gets way too complicated. And honestly, in humans, the electricity moves so fast, that's usually a non-issue. If you see things slow down, that's more the widening. We'll get to that later. And it, exactly. So you're losing quantity when you lose height. Okay? So now let's think about that. If you had to troubleshoot that, right, because this links us back to our initial concepts. Black jacket, tell me now, if you've lost electrical signal, what are the things that, that could contribute to that just purely about heart muscle? What could you have lost? Okay, so you could have, so, so what? Myocytes. So you could have lost myocytes. You could have lost heart muscle, right? So if your wires are activating heart muscle, if you lose heart muscle, you're going to have a shallow QRS. Have people heard of amyloid as a disease? People have, okay, so amyloid, Alzheimer's is accumulation of amyloid proteins in the brain. Those proteins can also affect heart muscle, kidneys, peripheral nerves, a bunch of other things. And everything it gets into, it's bad. It kills it. When it gets in the heart, one of the diagnostic things that can help you pick up amyloid is low amplitude QRSs because amyloid's gotten the heart muscle, the heart muscle died, so when there's a QRS and it fires, you lose signal. Right? So you actually may have normal speed. The wires may be totally fine. So you might see that the QRS is narrow, but it's really short. Okay? And that's a loss of signal. Now, other things, more simply, people, who, who's a nurse in here? All right, thank you for volunteering. For patients, what if you, if you could, so now also remember electricity isn't just, is a, is a, the electrical signal you're reading is a summation of a, of a number of things, both the amount of electrical signal and the machine's ability to read the signal. All right? And little old ladies, how, not to be pejorative, but let's say you have a you know, 80-year-old woman who's got heart disease, really bad heart. Have you ever had issues reading their EKGs? I, I ah. <laughs> no, even better, even better. How easy is it to do EKGs in, P, in children? It can be very challenging if they're moving around. Or... But if they hold still, let's say they're your very rare compliant child. <laughs> do you usually or unusually get signal on the machine when you hook it up? Okay. <laughs> well, no, it's okay. It's all good. Thank you for volunteering. The, uh, so you actually get great signal. Now, the reason, kids are tiny. Their heart is very close to their chest wall. For those of you who've done adult nursing, how often have you had the machine go off and say, we lost signal, right? And your patient who hasn't moved, they could be the ICU, they could be comatose, right? So if you have patients with bigger chests or people who've smoked, right, and their lungs are really inflated, it creates a lot of distance between the heart and the lead. So you will lose signal, okay? So really important lesson there is in terms of when you're looking at these things. Remember, this is just a summation of electrical signal. There are a lot of things that it can tell you about the person's body. Not all of them are about the heart. So every time you look at an EKG, you always want to make sure you look at your patient, you think about their body habitus, you think about all the different layers of things between your lead and your EKG, and that helps you know if it's real, right? So if you're sitting there and you're supposed to do a research EKG and you have a person with COPD, you know, and you can't get EKG signal to look a certain way, think about that saying, this may just be their normal because they have such hyperinflated lungs, their chest walls pushed away from the heart, and we're just going to have an abnormal-looking EKG. But again, there, the important thing is you put the leads in the same place every time, and then you can actually use it on serial research evaluation. Okay? So, now, so that was a digression. Okay, so we, and I think we, talk, we definitely talked about this already, so we're just going to go through it really quickly. Q wave is that first depolar or the first negative deflection as part of the QRS complex. R wave is the vertical. S is the bottom. Not all waves look the same, and ideally in an EKG, obviously since they're all measuring different directions, some are going to be positive, some are going to be negative, meaning some have bigger R waves, and some have bigger S waves. That's normal. Okay, and we already talked about segments. Now, 
The segments that we want to talk about here uh, is are, are there one thing that's really important here is that you would hear when you're interpreting to this term, the baseline. Okay? The baseline is considered the isoelectric point of an EKG, the point at which everything should be even. The heart is in a resting spot. It's sitting in the same spot in the chest, and that's our baseline. That's this. Now, this gets really important because when people breathe, if they're agitated, if they're tachycardic, what you see is the heart's swinging in the chest and the person's breathing. So your distance between your electrical readout and the person's heart has two factors that's changing on every cycle, right? Because the person's breathing is not in sync with their heart movement, so their heart's moving and their chest wall's moving in separate rhythms, right? So if you want to measure any of these segments, it's very common that if this person's hyperventilating, that this segment will occur, let's say, when they're inspiring, doing, and that may make this segment move up or down relative to the baseline over here. And so you need to keep an eye on that. So when you're looking at any of these segments, one of the really important things, and I know that, got, that gets a little bit complicated, this is why you can't look at any one of these segments in isolation. So that's why it's important to understand what all the leads are showing you. And using mul you always use multiple leads to interpret any segment, any piece of the cure, or any piece of these waves. You always have to look across multiple because it's very common that things will look very abnormal in one lead of the EKG. Okay? So just remember, this baseline is your friend. And if you're ever looking at any of the elevation or depression, upward or downward movement of any of these segments, you want to be comparing to this portion of the EKG. Questions? Okay. Now, let's look at, so the ST segment, let's talk about this one in isolation because the ST segment is something that people hear a lot about because this tells you a lot about ischemia, okay? So when people are having heart attacks, the most, like the thing, everybody you walk into e, an ER, if you say, I have chest pain, everybody is looking at this segment of the EKG to go up. So if you ever hear of a STEMI, people heard that term? STEMI? So that stands for ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. And what that represents is this, this goes up. That means in a vessel in your heart, a large vessel is occluded now. It's blocked. And you need to go to the cath lab immediately to have a stent put in. It doesn't apply to minor heart attacks. So if people have small blood vessels or have minor chest pain, they come in. And for those of you who've worked in the ER, here like a troponin, the blood level of something tells you there's heart muscle death that's low, like one. You go, okay, those people can go to the floor. We'll probably take them to cath lab later, but that's a very small blood vessel. You will never see this up. If this is up and somebody has chest pain, you don't do anything else. You don't send blood. You don't do anything. You take them straight to the cath lab because that means that blood vessel is blocked. Now, ST segment depression can also tell you something about ischemia. Okay? That can tell you the heart is under strain, but it's usually a small blood vessel. That is not an emergency. So people will talk a lot about ST segments. Again, always measuring that relative to baseline. That's ST segment depression. Yeah. Yeah, so Yeah, so there are, it's a little bit of a misnomer. The reason so QT uh, they, or they should all this should be renamed. Really, it should be a PQ interval. The issue is that you don't always have a Q, right? You more likely have, you all, pretty much always have an R. Not, I mean, that's, no, I shouldn't say pretty much always, but you usually have an R. The point of what this is trying to tell you, and again, this is why the concepts are important, and thank you for asking that, because this is where they, if we've done this lecture or been a cardiologist for a while, you forget where things are lost in translation. This is an electrical representation of electricity moving through the atrium, getting to the AV node. Right? The AV node then fires and starts your QRS. So wherever you see QRS activation starting, 
is really where this segment is measured. So this is what this is trying to tell you is how long does it take electricity to go from the SA node at the top through the entire atrium through the AV node to get to that hiss to start the QRS, right? That, so anytime you see any sign that the hiss is activated, that's where this measurement should be made. So the PR intervals can be measured from the onset of the QRS. Right? And that's why these concepts are so important. Because even if you think PR, like what's going on, just say if you think about what am I measuring, it's a little bit easier to start troubleshooting things. So what you're looking for is ventricular activation is the point where the PR interval stops. Okay? Now, so this ST segment, now the reason I want to talk about this is ST segment is part of repolarization, right? And repolarization, before you see any muscle death or wire death in ischemia, like if you block a blood vessel and heart muscles start dying, the first thing you lose is this process. This is very energy heavy. This happens in your brain also, right? So when people have strokes, before the brain starts to die, right, you start to have slurred speech and the symptoms start because the neurons don't fire anymore because they can no longer establish this gradient. Right, so this process, this comes, everything pins on this. This is very energy dependent. Very, it uses a ton of electric, or a lot of energy. So if you stop supplying oxygen, this stops very, very quickly. Okay, and then you can't have activity. But that's why, in this repolarization segment, that's why there's abnormalities here because that's what you're starting to lose. So. Now, the important thing to remember here is you can also have abnormalities in repolarization for a lot of reasons. So one of the things that's really important when you're doing clinical research and you start seeing ST segment changes, if somebody doesn't have symptoms, it's not ischemia, almost for sure. Okay, so we see this all the time you're in the clinic and somebody will have ST segments that will be sloped because they have abnormal repolarization. There's a ton of diseases, medicines that make this whole segment look funny. Okay, so this is a really important lesson. Clinical correlation for EKGs is really important. So when you see abnormalities, if your brain goes somewhere, let's say you saw this sloped up like this, and you go, oh my God, this is a STEMI. I see it in all the leads. They have no chest pain. It's not a STEMI. Right? It's a repolarization abnormality. You can always go get a doctor or get somebody who's in your group and then have them validate it. But it's really important to remember what you are looking at because there's a lot of reasons that that could happen. Right? So if you remember, repolarization is an active process and you see abnormalities in this segment of the EKG, you're seeing those abnormalities. All right? So keep that in mind. Now, QT interval, this is really important for clinical research. Uh, this interval here represents the duration of recovery. So, right, so the minute the top of the heart starts to depolarize, the very top of the heart then starts to recover. So even though other parts of the heart are firing, the, very, the far, part of the heart that started this process is already in its recovery phase. And the end of the T wave is the end of that recovery phase. Now, if you take, and there's tons of medicines that do this, and almost every clinical trial uh, has to monitor QT interval, because medicines will alter how long this process takes. And if this process gets too long, you can have extra beats that can sneak in in that window and cause dangerous fatal arrhythmias. They go, people go into ventricular fibrillation. And I don't know if you guys have people heard that term, V-fib, so V-fib arrest, like when people collapse the airport and you run over to paddles with them, you put the paddles on and shock them, they're usually in V-fib. They can also be in ventricular tachycardia, also called VT, but V-fib is a really scary one because that's the one where you have no pulse. That's when your ventricles are actually going 400 times, 300 times a minute, so you're getting no circulation in that window. So this active repolarization process is important to monitor because anytime it gets past a point, whatever you're studying is putting that person at risk for arrhythmias. So this part is about external repolarization? The repolarization? Atria, you can't really see it on here. So atrial repolarization is happening in here. So one of the things, atrias are really, really thin structures, right? They're these little tiny things on the top relative to the big moneymaker pump, the ventricles. And that is why 
activation in the P wave is so shallow, right? This is totally dwarfed by the QRS because it's a very thin muscle, so you get very little electrical signal out of it. And the repolarization process generates very little electrical activity. It's occurring in this window, but it's completely blended into the QRS. So there, yeah, there's probably pretty much no electro atrial recovery happening out here. Giving you a sense of where it is, if you think about it with AFib, if somebody's atria is depolarizing 400 times a minute, you're having depolarization sort of mixed in there. So that means that atrial depolarization probably just happens really, really rapidly. Okay. Now, T wave, yep, there we go. So this is, we just talked about that. We talked about the QT interval. Okay. Now, how you measure these things. So a few things. First, really, really, really important lesson. And if, when you're measuring these things, and again, this sort of goes back when I say you, you have to use all your leads, you have to look at multiple places on the EKG. Not every QRS is the same because how your QRS looks is rate dependent. So if somebody has an arrhythmia, let's go over here, and this happens, let's just say atrial fibrillation is very common. You have QRSs like this, and then you might have a QRS right here. You could even have one blending right there. And it looks funny, and then you have a long pause. Or sorry, that's wrong. Long pause, and then you have a QRS out here. Now, this one could look even wide like that and recover. So what's happening, that's disgusting. There we go. Okay, so what's happening here is if you had to measure anything of those intervals I showed you, where would you pick? Right? We don't know. Cardiologists couldn't even tell you. There's no agreement. When you look at research, people all yell at each other about the averages they picked and where they chose them, and nobody can make consensus. So the really important thing is that you remember, A, how to measure, B, that you look and make sure that what you're measuring is representative for that patient. And if you can't make a representative representation or uh, interpretation, that's fine. That's more important than putting in a bad number. Okay? And that happens all the time with arrhythmias. So remembering that, that you are, when you look at these intervals, I'm always really hesitant when I describe these time intervals because you can use these to make calculations. But if some, let's say you're doing something as simple as heart rate. If you look and say, okay, there are two QRS products here. This person's heart rate's 210. But then you look at the whole strip, and over 10 seconds, they have, uh, they have six heartbeats. What is their heartbeat? What's their heart rate? Yeah. 60, right? So when you're looking at this and you're measuring any given interval, what you need to look for and make sure that you recognize is that make sure that that interval is representative of what's going on over your whole strip. So you remember in one of those first, EK, uh, first slides, they showed you the rhythm strip at the bottom, right? You can always use that to do heart rate and also compare every QRS process and every interval between beats if there's irregularity so that you know that you're picking the right ones. You pick the wrong one, you get bad numbers. So, so now stepping back, we're going to look. So this is each one of these large tick marks represents one second. Okay? The whole piece of paper that you get when you print a standard EKG is 10 seconds. Now, that can change. People always talk about look at the paper speed and blah, 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 blah. That's so uncommonly changed these days, I would not worry about it at this point. It's almost always set standard. So when you hear those caveats, it's important to remember you can change paper speed, which makes the, how much time this interval represents different. It's very rare that that's the issue. Okay? And it's printed on the bottom, 25 millimeters per second. So you'll see that. So now, breaking these down, this box represents one of these, all right? And <clears throat> one of the things that's really important to remember, it's very, very hard a lot of the time to look at EKGs and really pick truly where each one of these, let's go forward a little bit, just use this as an example, where these boxes begin and end if you're just eyeballing this, right? And you're asked to make really subtle changes. If somebody goes from 100 to 120 milliseconds on their QRS, which we'll get to, that's abnormal, right? But that can be very hard to see, especially if somebody's moving. 
if they're breathing, they have low amplitude waves, your machine's not doing great. Like there's all sorts of things that can make this stuff look fuzzy. So picking onset and offset can be difficult. So the reason that this lesson here is so important is that if you understand how much each of these boxes represents, you can round. Do your math nice and simply and round into ballparks, okay? Because usually within ballparks and EKGs, that's appropriate if you're doing it accurately. So what you end up with here is each one of these little boxes, these tiny boxes, is 40 milliseconds. There's five small boxes in e each of these dark segments. That's 200 milliseconds, or 0.2 seconds. That's very convenient for things like PR interval. A normal PR interval is 200 milliseconds. Right? So if you have a really nasty looking EKG, and you can't tell exactly where there's the onset and the onset of the P wave, if you can see, is the distance from the beginning of that P wave to the onset of the QRS about one box, or is it more? Right? That's usually a much easier comparison than trying to really find exactly where it is. And you kind of say, oh, it's a one and a half boxes. That's abnormal. And that should even key you off. Like when you get better at reading EKGs, you read lots of them, you're looking for shortcuts like that. And so if you see that one and a half box, you know, my PR interval is too long, that's first degree heart block. That represents a delay in electricity moving from the atria through the AV node into the ventricles. So that's a very common thing. So remember, 200 milliseconds is big, is right here. And each one of these is 40 milliseconds. So another nice useful one, QRSs should be less than three boxes. Okay? So remember that. So you can say if a QRS goes from edge to edge, it's too long. Or if it's almost a whole box, it's too long. It can be really hard to see to measure the difference between subtle differences at three boxes. But if you remember that and look at a bunch of them and say most of these look like they're almost a full box, then I should flag that. Okay? Moving forward. Okay, so now, now we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the precordial leads. So now remember, limb leads was this field, right? So you have, it tells you if it's going left, right, up, down. And when you're talking, I, I think I bust over axis. Oh, axis is coming up. We'll talk about that. The precordial leads are telling you how electricity moves in this field, right? The perpendicular field. Because those chest leads, right, this is the precordial leads. So imagine what those electrical, or what those leads are seeing, right? So remember, let's put our hand out again, right? So V1, and they go very linearly, which somebody very nicely labeled rather than having AVR, AVL, and all these crazy labels. V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right? They just go straight across the heart. Electrical activation in V1, if V1's looking this way, electrical activation moves down your heart that way. So V1 should be largely negative, right? V6 and V5 are supposed to be out towards the apex of the heart. So those should be positive. Those should really see electricity going right from the top straight towards them. And so when, one of the things that you're looking for here in the precordial leads is to say progression of electricity. Now what that means is what you're trying to see, electricity is moving across the precordial leads in a way that you would expect. So V1 is more negative, a larger S wave. V2, right here, right, you're getting closer to the positive direction of electricity. It's more positive. V3, more, four, five, six, right? Because you're watching electricity get closer and closer to being purely positive, right? So if you have, imagine this is 100% positive, what you're watching is active scanning doing this. So you're seeing more, 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 more signal. Does that make sense? You're going V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So V6 has no negative component here. So you're seeing electricity go in a straight line from the top out to the apex. V5, there's a little bit of a negative component because it's just slightly off this way. So you're seeing a little bit of electrical signal going off at an angle that moves away from V5. Okay, and again, think about these in concepts, because if you try to microdissect each piece, hearts sit in chest differently, leads are not placed perfectly, 
chest wall, right? You have some people who are barrel chested. You have some people who are wider, right? So the, uh, the chest wall orientation will affect how these look as well. So don't get hung up on minor differences. Look for the trend. Okay? Ideally, the thing, one caveat with kids is in the pediatric world, if you're doing EKGs on people, they so commonly have congenital anomalies, right? Because kids' hearts are almost always fine outside of, they've had no, you know, no longitudinal injury outside of some chemotherapy for some kids. Um, but the uh, kids who have other issues are very commonly associated, or developmental issues, very commonly associated with congenital anomalies as well. Like the development of the heart is linked to all sorts of developmental processes of other parts of the body. So what you'll see is people who have all sorts of neurological lesions very commonly have associated heart lesions. So they'll show up to their doctor for a neurological problem, and then the doctor says, oh, let's get an ultrasound of your heart. That's why, because they're screening out other problems that can be linked. So when you get these EKGs, congenital disease of the heart it comes from the heart not building properly. And so if the heart doesn't build properly, your, your EKG tracings are very, very abnormal. There are that. The consensus on that is not great. There are some diseases, and we'll get to some of those at the end, where the, the uh, criteria are different for women and men because of sex differences. The thing that gets tough with that is, again, chest wall, right? So as pe if people are heavier, they're smaller, you imagine as people get older, they naturally very commonly lose weight when they're in their 80s, and their chest walls can get really, really small, and especially you know, as older women, especially they have bony issues, or they can get kyphotic, and the heart can get, if you're lean like this, the heart actually leans up against the chest wall, so you get really close apposition. So all of a sudden, if you have height criteria, like the height of QRS means something, that's very different from age to age, right? So it gets really tricky when you're talking, but you're right that this is a major issue of contention when people publish anything. There's so many variables that are hard to control. Is there another question over here? Bridges? So, so Bridges is a very contentious issue right now. So the, uh, lot of, there is a lot of people who don't believe in bridges because you see them all the time in the cath lab and these people are fine or have other issues. And they have the, This is a research center where we're really actively evaluating that. So I want to be really careful saying because that what I would say is that the people, they have great data here and they're producing really good research. It's a very rare thing to find these myocardial, bri myocardial bridge. Basically, normally the coronary arteries sit on the outside of the heart. Here's the muscle underneath. Sometimes the artery will dive into the heart muscle. Can everybody see that? Sorry, should I go higher? This is off topic, but it's interesting because you're going to read a lot about this in the future. So arteries, and they'll dive in. Heart muscle wall comes like this. And the arteries that normally should go this way are in the muscle. Muscle contracts, right? So the muscle should not affect flow down this vessel. When it goes down here, depending on a lot of complicated physics, if you have vascular compression, you can lose flow. And there have been some cases where people have gone into the lab where people just went down, passed out, and had a malignant arrhythmias like ventricular fibrillation when they're exercising. And one of the thoughts is if you have high heart rates, high oxygen needs, and compression, you kick off these dangerous arrhythmias, kids pass out, people die, and you have seen it. You also see these very commonly in the cath lab. We see them all the time. And many times a week, people have no symptoms. So what makes some symptomatic, some not symptomatic? And when you look at echoes or other EKGs, you'll find signs of this in people who have symptoms and people who don't have symptoms. So when you look at the diagnostic criteria, if you have no symptoms and you have this, what are the chances the EK what the EKG is showing you is truly representative of that? versus it's just a natural phenomenon that happens to be overlapping with bridges. So not well validated yet, 
Uh, but it's evolving. It will definitely be a thing. So I want to be careful. And I honestly don't even, I know the echo data. I don't know the EKG data. That's, yeah, I, so I couldn't really tell you something intelligent on that. But it is interesting. This is something you'll probably read about in the next 10 years. All right, so let's go to EKG interpretation. Oh, any other questions before we move on? Cool. All right, so now try to jam through here. So heart rate, again, so coming from the SA node, bradycardia is less than 60. Greater than 100 is tachycardia. Nice, easy cutoffs. Now, the moving on, so we're looking at, if you're ever looking at heart rate, one of the, th the thing that's important to remember is you are describing the rate at which the heart is circulating blood. So you're measuring QRS cycles. So you're counting the tall waves, not the P waves. Ideally, those two things overlap. That's not always true. So remember, if somebody asks you to calculate heart rate, and especially in arrhythmia patients, you're counting R wave to R wave. And that is one cardiac cycle. What that means is the time it takes to go from contraction to relaxation to be just before it fires again. Right? Now, you can do This is talking about what I was looking at first. So you can count the boxes if somebody has a normal, dead normal rhythm, or an alive normal rhythm, I should say. You go from box to box, and you can, the way the math works on this is if you have one QRS complex here and one here, that would represent a heart rate of 300 on these dark lines. Going over here, this takes you down to 150. If you had a QRS complex here, that'd be 100, 75, 60, 50. So this person's heart rate's probably 80-ish, just above 75, okay? Now, that's if it's regular. If it's irregular, you take that 10-second strip, you count the number of QRS cycles, and then you say, multiply that by six. And that's how many of those happen in a minute on average. Okay? So that's if it's irregular. You'd have to do that. So now it's so again getting to regular versus irregular. Who can tell me? Let's go who's been quiet. Maybe back corner. Back corner. Can you tell me, is this regular or irregular? Regular, okay, good, thank you. So you can see, right, there are intervals between each one, grossly look the same. Other things that you can do just to run confirmatory tests in your mind, right, you're always checking everything. You think it's regular, you see a P wave, and then a QRS, and a P wave, and a QRS. Almost always, if you see a P wave and QRS and that just looks regular, it's gonna be regular, because the sinus node is driving it. One thing also, just important point, remember when we're talking about abnormalities, Usually you, want, you really want to focus on large abnormalities. So the sinus node actually varies in its heart rate from bit to bit, so that with your breathing cycle, it naturally varies. So you'll see, you might see small variations in people's heart rates. And as people get older, they can actually get more sensitive to the heart rate changes with breathing. So you'll see, if you watch their breathing, you can actually see their heart rate go from you know, 70 to 80 over an EKG strip, which represents their inhaling and exhaling. That would still be regular. You can get into subtle diagnoses of like sinus node arrhythmia or whatever. Don't worry about that stuff. Like if it's sinus node, then QRS, and it's largely regular, you can call it regular. Okay? So again, broad strokes. Now, axis. So when people get, we talk about axis, this is only talking about electricity in this field, in the limb leads, the precordial leads completely ignored an axis. And what the idea is with axis, and again, this is use, think about this in gross directions. And for people who are not electrophysiologists, I think the best way to, and this is true for most doctors, the best way to think about it is quadrants. Quadrant one, quadrant two, three, and four. All right? Normal is one. Right, so this is the left ventricle. This is where V6 is, way out here, but again, ignore. Don't get hung up on that. Don't use precordial leads. You want electricity to be moving that way. Right, so your heart, remember if you put your hand up again, remember where the electricity is going? It's going out this direction, somewhere around 45 degrees. Anywhere in here is normal, all right? And again, remember, it's not just the way the heart sits, but it's also how the chest is oriented. So scoliosis kyphosis, 
anything that changes how you are oriented will change the axis. All right. So again, abnormal axis is again why limb, limb lead or, or yeah, limb lead placement is important to do consistently in people, because if you want to know what the axis of the heart is doing, it's totally dependent on lead placement as well. You mix up your leads, you change them just a little bit, the number comes out differently. So the way you do this is, I want to go back to an EKG. Let me just jump back here really quickly. Um, you need to summate the direction of your signals. So positive tells you electricity is moving that way. So what I first do is I look at all the positive leads. So somebody, let's go an NH jacket. So what leads are positive here? Remember, just that half. Ignore all this, all the precordial leads. So one, OK? What else is positive? OK. There you go. Three. ABL. OK, good. Now, the, make sure those are right. Yeah, yeah. So now think about the direction on that. So what directions are you looking at? OK. So positive is what direction on that? So think. So left, right? ABL is positive up that direction. And one thing I'm just noticing now, that lead three, that actually is a PVC, that first one. So you can't use it. OK, so ignore this one. This is misleading. This is a ventricular, premature ventricular contraction. These two. So this can be very misleading. Look at three. So if somebody said three is positive. Is three positive? Is it net positive? Right? So net direction matters a lot. That's actually the key, right? So, but yeah, ignore this. So, but these two, but this is up, but what's this? Oh, yeah, it's, equal. it's equal. So it's isoelectric, right? So that's important. So that means electricity is moving perpendicular to three. So one, ABL, right? And two is positive, has a, has a minus component. So if you had to pick here between AVL and two, which is more positive? I'd argue the opposite. This is your T wave, right? So two has a negative component there as an S wave. AVL has no S wave. So AVL is perfectly positive. So your two purely positive leads are one and AVL. Two is still positive because it gets some electrical signal going this way, but there is a negative deflection. Again, this is sort of why I talk about things. You've got to look at things in gross because if you get hung up on any little piece, it's like, what exactly does that mean? It's very hard to interpret. Look at things that are really obvious. Right? If you see something's purely positive, it's purely positive. So that helps you with access. So you are sitting now in quadrant four. You'd be way, way out here. Okay? So that's too far. We call that left axis deviation. And now we'll go forward. Let me go back. This can be very confusing. Is it? Let me just tell you a little, get this, and then we'll take questions. So that's up here. Normals, quadrant one down here. And then right axis deviation is the other half. So right axis deviation is anything to the right of 90 degrees. Okay? You will almost always see right axis deviation in here. Something up here is going to be ventricular tachycardia. Don't worry. I mean, that's something totally separate, almost always. But that's, so that's right axis deviation. <coughs> Questions? I know axis is very confusing to a lot of people. We spend, the interns get pimped on this every morning for, when they're reading EKGs for months. Sort of grossly concrete? OK. We'll move on. So intervals. Calipers are your friend. And again, like I said, these, these little boxes are really hard to read. So having your calipers, one of the tricks you can do is when you measure something, you can put it on the two points you're trying to measure, put your calipers. The reason they lock is you can tighten the top, right? And they don't move. You then take those and put them on the dark lines of the EKG to measure. 
So if you, if you take an EKG, and let's see, let's go back here, right? If you have these light boxes, it can be really hard to use those to measure. If you measure the width of this QRS like that, and you lock your calipers, I then go to the top, and I set one edge on one of the dark lines, and then I see how many small boxes am I away from the beginning. So that's a, that's a trick that everybody should remember from this lecture, because when you're measuring any of these intervals, it's very hard to count the tiny little boxes accurately. Very error-prone system. If you move up, if you take, if you, let's say you measure QT, you do this, and then you go up here, and you go, I'm going to set my caliper edge on this dark red line, and then measure how many dark red boxes, and then let's say you got here, how many white boxes past that dark red line am I measuring? Right, that gives you really concrete landmarks, and then you're only expected to measure the difference from there to that first red line, which is much, much easier to do than to count 12 small hazy boxes. Okay? So calipers are your friend. And we talked about the intervals before. So PR interval representing atri electricity moving through the atria, getting to the AV node before it moves into the ventricles, which is the QRS complex. And then the QT interval representing the whole process of repolarization where these ions are being separated, okay? So PR interval, that less than 200 milliseconds, remember, one box, that's your friend, because you can just look at an EKG. It's one of the fewest intervals you can actually look at. It's actually the only interval you can really look at and tell whether or not it's normal by just eyeballing an EKG. You can almost always find a P wave that's followed by a QRS close enough to like a really dark line in an EKG where you can say this is either one of those big sets of boxes, less or more, right? That's a really nice way to cheat. Going at PR interval. So now QRS duration. Again, this represents the depolarization of the ventricle. So electricity moving through those wires. And then all the heart muscle moving together. You want it to be less than 120. Usually between 100 and 120 is sort of a gray area where there's some, se some sense that there's actually a problem in the heart. But 120 is where criteria begins for disease. So three small boxes. Three of those little tiny gray boxes. So if you remember that also that 100 is uh, your cutoff where you start thinking about it, it's half of one of those boxes. Remember, PR intervals, 200, so between the dark lines, you can use those. You can use half of that distance as your metric in your brain to say, do I need to be paying attention to that? Because that's conveniently 100 milliseconds. So rather than looking, is this is three, is it two? If you say this is on average is more than one of those big boxes, I need to sit down and really measure this because we're getting into criteria range for disease. Okay, now QT interval. Okay, this is important uh, for, like I said, drugs that are in a lot of the trials that you guys be doing research on uh, will lengthen this process, the repolarization process, and you can have malignant arrhythmias in there. So it's really important to measure well. There are some things, that, uh, one important thing, EKG machines are really, really good at measuring this. Almost everything else needs to be revalidated because the way it's calculated by the computer is not great. QT interval very commonly is accurate. You can almost always use the machine number. And you'll hear about something called the QTC. What that is, the QT is corrected. So that's what the C stands for. There are some... Uh, some standard equations, Fredericia and Bichette's, and those help you correct for heart rate. So the QT interval needs to be corrected depending on the heart rate because your risk at slow heart rates is higher than at high heart rates, right? And you also imagine if your heart rate is, let's say your heart rate, P wave, QRS, T wave, and then immediately P wave, QRS, T wave, right? The relationship that repolarization, this may be really short because your heart rate, right, your repolarization process, everything in your heart related to rate is dictated by your need for oxygen. So if you're sprinting, right, your heart rate needs to go up, which means both depolarization needs to happen faster and relaxation needs to happen faster. Otherwise, the heart won't be ready for the next beat. So they both speed up, right? So if you have a really fast heart rate, this is not necessarily reflective of what your QT is at rest. So you, what you do is you correct for both high and low heart rates. 
So that's when you're seeing this pop out of the machine, you'll see QTC or QT Fredericia or QT Bichette's. All that is is the QT algorithm being plugged into an equation. You don't need to know it. That's not important that you know it. They know that they're very accurate. And usually greater than 480 is a problem. That's where you need to start flagging things. And greater than 500 is a big problem. And slow heart rates, so you also need to think about it more. You're more at higher risk for these arrhythmias. Okay. Um, the other thing to remember, QT, and because we have some pediatric people in here, pediatric, and people mentioned uh, syncope, prolonged QT intervals is a, has a risk of sudden death. There are people who have mutations in this process. So their heart doesn't recover right. And if they have extra heartbeats that land in that window, they go into those fatal arrhythmias and they pass out. So screening for that, if somebody's ever passed out in your clinic, that's one of, and children especially, that's one of the things you look for, is prolonged QT intervals in kids. Yeah? So, difficult question. A lot of palpitations, and when, when you see people, we can send them home with monitors on their chest for two weeks, and every time they feel a palpitation, they push the button. Depending, it depends on what clinic you're in, because every clinic, the likelihood for false testing goes up if you're like a general cardiologist and you're seeing everybody. Right? Somewhere around, in my experience, 75, 80% of button pushes have normal rhythm. Normal rhythm. So whatever that person felt in their chest, and they probably felt something. I don't dis dismiss that they felt nothing because it's very reproducible. These people are really having symptoms. It's not their heart rhythm. So palpitations, feeling that in your heart, it, it, it's not, and it's not clear in those cases where it's not a palpitation. Medicine sort of disregards it doesn't mean it's nothing. It just means that it's not heart rhythm. Um, most commonly, what I see them associated with, the things that people tend to see, uh, feel the most, is extra beats that are not associated with a P wave. You know, the, sometimes the ventricles will just fire on their own, just randomly, and people very commonly feel those because the way calcium, the way the heart strength of beat happens immediately after, the next beat after them is really strong. And so you feel like this almost jolt in your chest, that's one of the things I see people feeling really commonly. And people who have really bad hearts, if they have minor runs of arrhythmias, since their hearts are so sensitive, because their hearts don't, can't compensate well, right, if they're really weak, they'll feel arrhythmias all the time. They'll feel little runs of things that other people wouldn't feel. So it's very dependent on the patient and what kind of heart you have in their chest. Oh, wouldn't that just a benign heart murmur? Mm-hmm. So... Yeah. No, not usually. So murmurs are the sound that uh, blood makes flowing across a valve. And so abnormal flow. So normal flow, like laminar flow, like if you have a garden hose and you just turn it on, it just flows and you barely hear anything, you kink it and you hear a psh, right? Same thing happens in your heart. If you narrow a valve or you make a valve leak, that abnormal blood flow makes a noise. And there are a lot of heart murmurs, especially in young people, where the blood's moving really, really fast, right? If you ever turn your faucet on full speed, you hear it, whereas if it trickles, you barely hear anything, right? So young people of strong hearts often have heart murmurs purely by the speed of blood moving over the valve. It's very much like plumbing. But you don't, remember, this is the electrical representation. So there can be things that are associated with EKGs that cause heart murmurs, but the EKG doesn't show you that. This just shows you the electricity associated with that heart. Okay, so QT interval. All right, so we, we talked about this already. So remember, th so this is the PR interval. And this, imagine if there are atria here, and then this is the AV node. So what you're measuring, remember, is the process of electricity moving through the atria, through the AV node, to the point where it exits the AV node, which is right here. And that's where you see the ventricles start to depolarize. So that's a, that's a big one. This is important. So first degree block. So there's first, second, third degree heart block. They all describe different levels of disease here. First degree heart block is extremely common. You'll see it all the time. It's not dangerous. All it means is the AV node generally is aging. It's pretty rare that it's associated with really serious diseases as like a primary presentation. Um, but almost always, you'll, you'll see this in older people. If you get over the age of 70 or 80, this is extremely, extremely common, just of age-related changes in the node. Now, when you get in the second degree block, what you see is sometimes it can't keep up, and so you'll see heartbeats start, and then the ventricle will never fire. And what that represents is that the heartbeat 
the electricity just got lost in here. It got here, and this node had not completed this process, and since it didn't complete this, the heart can't fire. So, and then you just have no heartbeat afterwards, and then you'll see it catch up. So, let's talk about that real quick. So, two types of heart block. Two, there's, so this got, somebody should have renamed this differently. It's very confusing. But heart, second degree heart block type one, okay? What you see is you see this P wave, I mean QRS, normal relationship, less than one full box, right? Here, all of a sudden you see the P wave, and now this distance is much, much longer, right? Now you have a P wave fire, very long. Now you have a P wave, no beat, and then normal. What that represents is this process getting more and more taxed. So it's, it can keep up for those first three beats, but then after it's asked to fire four times, it doesn't complete this, and then it can't transmit that fourth heartbeat. Then it recovers and has a normal beat. Okay? The fundamental difference between that and type 2 is there is no change in the relationship between the P wave and the QRS. So you can see here, P wave's there, very beginning. First QRS. Here, there's no change in that distance in the PR interval. P wave, no beat. P wave, no beat. Normal relationship, normal relationship, normal, drop. So that definition of normal followed by a P wave with no QRS complex is type 2. reason this is important is because this is a pacemaker. This is an urgent pacemaker. This, people go home. Very rarely does this progress, this, and this gets more complicated. It has to do with where the disease is in the node and the sensitivity of that part of the node to progress into complete heart block, which is down here on the bottom. Let me put down the mannequin. And what this means is there's a complete disassociation of the atria and the ventricle. So the atria are firing. Every heartbeat that hits that AV node is not transmitted. Fortunately, the ventricle has its own pacemakers that can fire at very, very slow heart rates. But what you'll see is these P waves. So there's this P wave, and then a very, very long pause that makes it unlikely to have done this. If this signal probably got lost in the AV node there. But then you confirm that, and you go, oh, wow, this is really long, really long. And then there's a short one. So it's, it's, there's no physiologic situation in which you would have this much of a delay followed by a normal relationship. So what that's telling you is these two things are firing independent of each other. To confirm that, you take your calipers, and what you'll see is that this heart rate, the QRS to QRS, is regular. Those intervals will be the same. And then you measure the P wave intervals, and those will be the same between each P wave, and those numbers will be different and unrelated. Good question. This depends a lot on how much block there is. So what you'll see in some patients, in extreme cases, you may have something like five heartbeats and one transmitted reliably, and your heart rate could be 20. And that person is going to feel it, right? Your heart rate at 20, that you can barely walk down the street. Or you probably can't even walk. You can't even stand up. You have other people who will drop a beat every seventh or eighth beat. So their heart rate may be 70. And if they're older, they may not do much, right? They may do, go shopping or they'll walk around, but they can actually keep up with life at that heartbeat. And you'll catch some, rarely, but you'll catch some of these on screening EKGs where you do an EKG and you go, oh, my God, you have secondary heart block. And those, the reason you put that in is it's very likely to progress. So where this block occurs, these people very commonly come in with low heart rates or drop beats, or they'll have long periods where they didn't have a heartbeat and they'll have passed out or gotten really dizzy. And you'll see that very commonly here. But you don't really see that until there's just enough of a window where your heart doesn't beat. Does that make sense? Like the block has to be bad enough that you miss enough heartbeats that your brain doesn't get oxygen. So the presentation on this is really is highly variable. You can imagine some people come with heart rates of 70, some people come with heart rates of 30, and we don't really know when they've started, right? Like there's sort of historical data where we know that this is very likely to progress, and that's why we put pacemakers in. It pretty much always progresses. 
but the timeline of that is very unclear. So the problem is when you go from that, the, this disease turns into this. The important point is this does not necessarily become this. There are two different points in the AV node that are diseased. Okay, we got a jam here, sorry. Okay, so now when we're looking at uh, some of the other criteria, so things that I want to harp on real quick. Let's, let's go back here. Yeah. Oh, this is pacemaker when you put that in for block. Uh, so hypertrophy, remember we're measuring, you can measure the amount of myocytes that are activated. And so you can see if somebody has a really thick heart, you're going to have these really big QRS complexes. They're so big they're running into each other. So remember that lesson in the very beginning, what overlapping waves mean, or what height on the QRS means. So it can mean a lot of muscle. You see that? Tell, you should have an echo. You should really look at the structure of the heart. Um, myocardial infarctions. Okay, so this is ST segment elevation. And what you're seeing, so this blood vessel, this is one of those blood vessels that runs on top of the heart that I drew right there. If that gets closed, that's where this ST segment elevation MI starts. So you start to see those repolarization abnormalities. And what you see is if you end up with a dead chunk of muscle, there's no signal. And what you'll see is in an EKG lead, you'll start to see Q waves that are tall. So greater than two millimeters, what you're seeing is an absence of signal in that lead, and you're measuring the electricity moving in the opposite direction on this side of the heart. So that's what, so when you see Q waves, tall Q waves, more than two millimeters, what you're seeing is not electrical activity here, you're seeing electrical activity moving in the opposite direction on the opposite side of the heart because this is basically just a hole now, it's just scar. And that gets a little bit complicated, but we'll t we can keep going. All right, so premature atrial beats, so now this is, again, remember, this is something that is hard to talk about, and a lot of people mix this up in the inpatient. So one thing to remember is your basics. So P waves, right? So this is, you see electricity moving from the top right over to the left. When you have a PAC, what this is an extra beat. The atria is just firing an extra time for various reasons. This looks different than that. And so what this, how this helps you make the diagnosis, if you remember your vectors of your electricity, this clearly started from a different point than your normal sinus beat, right? So normal sinus should go this way. If now all of a sudden you're seeing electricity go the opposite direction, that means that your electrical signal started on the other side of the heart, on the other side of the atria. 